for those brothers and sisters who are new to Islam or those who are visiting the community, what I just read in Arabic is traditionally what's read to open up a Friday sermon that extorts us to faith, extorts us to piety, to social responsibility, and also reminds us of the foundations of mainstream uh, Orthodox Islam. One of the most important things that a Muslim is aware of is the obligation of the moment. And that's why, for example, in books of Usul al-Fiqh, we find that wajib or fart has different degrees. There's like different levels of intensity of what is obligatory. What Imam uh, Ibn Qayyim called fard al-waqt, the obligation of that moment in which a Sheikh Ahmed Zarouk, he said a very beautiful statement, تقديم الأهم على المهم شأن الصادقين في كل شيء. He said that the ability to prioritize what's really important over what's secondary importance in its importance is the way of the righteous people. And that's why some of our teachers would say whoever has been gifted to see through the clouds of a moment and identify what is the most important obligation upon that person at that moment, this is a sign of tawfiq. This is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided that person to be successful. And it's very rare. That's why the word tawfiq is mentioned only once, once in the Quran. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِلَاهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيبُ That my success, and here it means in line with Sharia compliance, is only from Allah. And to be negligent is to ignore the obligation of a moment, the obligation of a certain time. And the obligation of this moment is Palestine. And the obligation of this moment is for everyone who can to utilize their ability and their strength and their support to amplify the situation happening in Palestine. If we understand that being able to address the opportunity of a moment or the obligation of a moment is from tawfiq, then that means there is going to be obstacles to that because there's always obstacles to success. It happens. That's why it's called a set. Sahu means that you knew something but you forgot it later. Like such as sahu, we have it. Al-ghafla. Ghafla means to neglect something. ar Not to care about something. All of these we are warned about in the Qur'an. وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Don't be negligent. So it's important that we approach this issue in a number of ways. Number one is we educate ourselves about its importance. Number two, that we're aware of those obstacles that may present themselves in our lives that will keep us from addressing the obligation of the moment. So that's what we'll talk about briefly today in this short khutbah. The first is that the issue of Gaza is an issue of the Ummah. That the issue of Palestine is the issue of an Ummah. And one of the things that's tried to take us away from seeing that is the modern state. And the creation of the modern state within the Muslim world. And modern borders. And the amplification of ethnicity such that it is given tarjih over being part of the ummah. But if we look at religious texts, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the greatest success of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a Prophet, his greatest miracle after the Quran is considered al-Isra wal miraj the night journey of the Prophet ﷺ, which was physical, not spiritual, not a dream. It happened to him physically, sallallahu And in that moment of great success, of tawfiq, Allah says, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Glorified be the one who took his abd. He didn't say Nabi, he didn't say Rasul, he didn't say Muhammadin, alayhi salam. He said, 
abdihi, because abdihi means servant and slave, because at the greatest success of the Prophet, he was in full servitude to Allah. So now when I'm having success in the office or success online or success gaming or success on campus, I have to remind myself the duality of success is not only to achieve, but to achieve com compliant with ubudiyya, to be the abd of Allah, the servant of Allah. Also Allah said, Ulfulu ard al allati katab Allahu lakum. In the fifth chapter of the Quran, Allah refers to this area as Ard Muqaddas, as sacred ground. There are also hadith of Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that encourage a ribat, said the best place for anyone to stay in defense of the Ummah. And he mentions this area that was known as Asqaland. But part of that area is Gaza. And we see these people, subhanAllah, their sacrifice, what they're going through is indescribable, unbelievable. Such this hadith was embraced that you find the grandson of Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he died in Ribat in Gaza. He died there, he went there for Ribat. Sayyidina Sufyan al-Thawri, the great scholar, he used to go there and he stay, would stay there 40 days at a time to be on the borders to preserve the safety and sanctity and defend the humma of the Prophet Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, one of the reasons that he went and stayed in Al-Quds for so long was because of this hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Even before the time of the Messenger of Allah, Gaza has great importance such that the Prophet's grandfather, Hashim ibn Abd al Manaf, who introduced those journeys that are mentioned in the Quran, Rihnat al Shita'i wa Sayyid. The journey to the north was to now what is known as Gaza. And that's why yesterday I saw a flyer put out by the Zionists that said the Ghazat Hashim, they actually know the real name of the place. Ghaza is ikhtisaran, but its actual name is Ghazat Hashim, named after the grandfather of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is buried in Ghaza, who his grave is next to a masjid. And that's why in the Battle of Tabuk, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Christians came and met him, and they said, these are some of the personal items and wealth of your grandfather that we are returning to you. And Sayyidina Abbas radiallahu anhu, he actually distributed this amongst Bani Hashim subhanallah. And Abu Sufyan, his relative Abdul Shams, who was the, the, the brother of the Prophet's grandfather, he distributed amongst the Umuis, amongst his family, because also his brother, uh, Hashim, he died with him in Gaza. You can look at Islamic history and you will find the importance of this place. The Prophet mentioned it in the hadith I talked about earlier. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he sent out Amr ibn As on his first expedition, the first city that fell to the Sahaba and their students was Gaza. And that's why Sayyidina Umar al-Fattab radiallahu anhu, he established a masjid there known as Masjid al-Umari, which was destroyed, subhanAllah, by the crusaders, but then rebuilt by the Turks. And Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah in Al-Bidayah wa Nihai describing the gatherings of Ibn Taymiyyah fi Masjid al-Umari. And he mentions that it was packed with people. There are great scholars that came from Gaza. Imam Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, his origin is Ghazawi, summa Makkawi. And that's why Imam Shafi'i said, and in one of his poems he wrote, I miss Gaza, I long to go to Gaza. It deceived me after I left it. You know, when you live somewhere, you don't like it. But when you leave it, you love it. May Allah bless this land and bless its soil. 
Al Hafiz Imam Ibn Hajar. His name was Asqalani because he was from that area. And that's why that area amongst the people of knowledge, not amongst the awam, amongst the scholars, you know the name for it? Mulbitul Ulama. Wal Arifin Billah. The place that seeded scholars and seeded those who know Allah. Outside of all of the fashionable history, what should be at the forefront of our concern is murder and the loss of life and the destruction of civil society and colonization and Eurocentricism and now under genocide Job. The continued experiment of America in conquering and destroying and ripping societies in half and locating the occupied as the occupier, the victim as the murderer. And that should cause us to be motivated enough. The Prophet وسلم, as related by Imam Abu Dawood with a good isnad, he said that there will be a person punished in his grave to the extent that he will say to those malaika, what did I do to deserve this punishment? And those malaika will say, You passed by oppression and you did nothing. That takes us now into two important areas that we should be aware of. Because there are two groups that influence the mind of Muslims more than anyone else. One is a group who is focused on the literary meaning of text without responsible interpretation. The other is a group that focuses on spirituality without any regard for text. That's why Sayyidina Shaf said, Faqihan wa Sufiyan fakun laysa wahidan. Don't be either of those. Be in the middle. And one of the challenges that Muslims face in holding our responsibility outside of the other issues related to decolonality, having a mind that's rooted in nation and state and language instead of a, right, a mind rooted in human values and the responsibility of being a human being is this challenge, the textual challenges and then the spiritual challenges. Presented in smooth ways on TikTok and Instagram and through writings as a way to dissuade Muslims from being committed to removing this in incredible injustice. Because we have to be honest, the remedy to the issue of Palestine is not a ceasefire only. It is Palestinian liberation from being colonized and oppressed. If you can't say that, don't talk. Because four hours of not being bombed, you need two hours to make sure it's, uh, it's true. You need one hour to get your wits together. And the last hour, you're worried about when the bombing will start again. How is that humane? That is psychological torture. So how do we push in? Number one, we have to be careful of agents and sellouts. We have to be care of people. I don't care what kind of thobe and turban they got on. I don't care how religious they are and how long their beard is. If they are discouraging you from caring about the oppressed and pushing into injustice, you should be careful of them. You should be careful of them. Sayyidina Adis ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he narrates that no one was braver than the Messenger of Allah. This is one of the shamayat of Sayyidina Rasul. So I he's brave. Alayhi salatu salam, he said, nas. He was the bravest person that I ever met in my life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first is the idea that is pushed by some people that this is from Allah. And since it's from Allah, you should just accept it. For you to oppose... What Allah has decreed is somehow you violating Tawheed. This is absolute nonsense. Has nothing to do with any basic two-year-old book on theology, whether you're Hanbali or Kalami. Everyone agrees on this. That there is a difference between what Allah has decreed and what Allah has commanded. What Allah has decreed is conditioned on what He's commanded. 
If he has decreed for you and I something wrong, we stick to the command. If he has decreed something good, then we go with it. And that's why in Surah Al-Kahf, you find the foundations of Islamic social justice, I like to use the word human justice, as well as uh, uh, commitment in the story of Sayyidina Musa. Because if that's the case, that argument, that whatever Allah has decreed, you should just accept it, be quiet, roll with it, alhamdulillah, don't, don't make a fuss, then why would he have said prophets? Because the prophets oppose his, his decree. The decree is the test. Allah decreed that Abu Lahab will be a kafir, but he commanded the prophet to call him to the haqq. Did the prophet say, well, Allah decreed Abu Lahab is kafir, I'm done, I have to, alhamdulillah, just give up. That my people around me are doing fahish, just be quiet, just go with the show, don't say, this is, this is illogical. But we find Sayyidina Musa, why can he not be quiet? Why does Hadr say to him, This is literal, not figurative. You will not be able to be patient. Why? Because you're a Nabi. You're a Rasul. And a messenger will not be able to be quiet because Allah has decreed and commanded them to be the people of Haqq. Because what I'm about to do is going to challenge what you've been commanded to do. And you will not be quiet in front of a violation of the command. So what happens? He destroys property. Sayyidina Musa cannot be quiet. He kills someone. Sayyidina Musa cannot be quiet. He refuses to be paid for his work. Sayyidina Musa cannot be quiet because it is not possible for a prophet to be quiet when the decree violates the command. And that's why Khadr says to him at the end, the last thing he says, وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ مِنْ مِنْ أَمْرِ بَلْ أَمَرِنِ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكَ This is not from my command. This is from the command of Allah. So then Sayyidina Musa knows, I'm dealing with a heavy hitter here. That's what Allah commanded him. This is what Allah has commanded me. And neither of us can violate his command in, phrase, in the face of the relative that we're dealing with. So number one, the idea that you, you know, just take it. This is what Allah has decreed goes against the teachings of the Prophet and goes against the foundation of the moral test mentioned in the Quran over and over and over again. <inaudible> we have commanded and shown the difference between guidance and misguidance and people are going to choose. What's this choice? الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عمرا who created death and life to test you. This is the test. When the whole world around me is on fire, do I grab a pail and put it out or do I burn myself with everyone else? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَدَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah is with those who are resilient. When? When that contradiction happens. And that's why Sayyidina Ismail, he says to his father, Ya Ibn Allah, don't worry. Do what you were ordered because the command is what we have to stick to. We have to submit to the command instead of submitting to the world. And the essence of submission is what? Islam. That's what Islam is. It's guts. It's foundation. Is that when everything is contradicting what's in the book and sunnah, I stick to the book and sunnah. That's why I'm Muslim to Allah. Not Muslim to a dunya. You will find me what? Sabir. Resilient with this test. So the first idea that is out there at times is the idea of surrender to the decree of Allah, which neglects the command of Allah. But that will make us more relativists. But that is not who we are. And that's the reason fiqh is important. Because fiqh teaches me the ruling for the moment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us basira. We ask Allah to allow us to see what is truly the call of a moment. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-musari wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah harud li wa astu'u lakum. Fastaghfiru inna huwa ghafur rahim.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين على آله وصحبته أجمعين We continue now to center our discussion around what's going on in, in Palestine, in Gaza, the West Bank. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَنْصُرْهُمْ وَيُثَبِّتْهُمْ الْحَقِّ وَيَحْفَظَهُمْ الْأَفَاتِ وَأَنْ يُقَوِئْهُمْ أَمَامَ أَعْدَائِهِمْ يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ the other thing that I hear sometimes people sharing, talking about, is the idea that, again, surrendering to Allah is a means to neglect al-wasila. Al-wasila in Islamic law are very important. Wasila means the means to do something. Like wudu is wasail for salah. But this, again, only reveals that that person is remedial in their understanding of Islam and deficient in their scholarship. Because we have a great axiom in Islamic law. That means take on the ruling of their objectives. Another way we phrase it in Usul of Fiqh. Whatever allows me to complete an obligation became an obligation. One of the greatest obligations, which Sayyidina Shah Tabi mentions in the Muwafaqat, which is certain, is the establishment of justice. That's why the role of the scholar is to be a person who establishes justice. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those scholars who are true to their scholarship in the context of angels. Shaheed Allah wa anna ula ilaha illahu wal malaikat wal ulu al-ilmi qa imam bil qist. Allah testifies that there is no God but him, as do the angels, as do the scholars. Why? Because just as the angels, the not the, the, the angels are kept from sin by the grace of Allah, the true scholar who has true knowledge will be protected from sin by that knowledge by the grace of Allah. They will do the right thing. They will not fall into neg negligence. But what we find people telling people is things like protest are haram. Why? And why are those people say that? They're seeing that from countries where we know what's going on there. Scholars, they have a gun to their head. In fact, recently I was here. Someone told me protesting in America is haram because this is sedition against the state. I said, really? But... The, the, the leader of this state encourages people to protest. That argument's out the window. Then he said, well, uh, yeah, uh, we know what that is. But when there is a limited ability to make change, certain means, rulings change. We don't have the political power to change what's going on in Gaza. We don't have the military power to change what's going on in Gaza. We don't have those more perhaps political ways, the Muslim governments are a complete disaster. They're not leaders. They are babysitters to enforce the colonial agenda on the Ummah. In fact, Quds will not be liberated until Mecca and Medina are liberated, until Cairo is liberated, until Baghdad is liberated, until Damascus is liberated. And people don't like that kind of talk because that talk brings it home until Karachi is liberated. We haven't had one prime minister finish his career in Pakistan. That's not because of the Pakistani people. That's because of outside influence. So the Muslim world is being babysat by people who are benefiting from colonial investment. That's the reality of our, 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 our nation. People don't care. They care about themselves. They give good talks. As one brother said, I saw one leader, he said, if they kill one more baby, I'm going to have another concert. A concert? A concert where you take pictures and put it on Instagram and you feel good about yourself? The death of children now is a fashion moment? None of them have pulled their Israeli embassies. None of them have shut them down. Because if they really cared about this, they would at least pursue diplomacy. Basic diplomacy. So what can you and I do in this country? We do what we can. What I commanded you to do, you do your best. 
We're limited in what we can do. We, have, we, we are law-abiding citizens, alhamdulillah. Look how we act in our protests compared to other people. I was in New York City two days ago. There was a woman from the Zionist. She was spitting on us. She was 80 years old. She was spitting on us. I said, are you 80 or two? Like, subhanAllah, itfa bin lati ahsan. And that's why people hate us, because we give back with what's better. We melt people's hearts. How many people became Muslim just in the last month? How many people started to read the Quran just in the last month? How many people were moved by the great morality? We are the morally supreme community in the world. Look how we're demanding people feel sorry, at least shamed at seeing the death of children and women and babies and people laugh at us because that's not how we are. We're forbidden to harm people except in the case of necessity, but always children, never. So what is one of the means we have? Protest. Are there evidences for protest? Because here comes the textual side of it. Where's the evidence? This is bid'ah. First of all, bid'ah doesn't apply to this. Your thinking is a bid'ah. Because you don't know what you're talking about. Bid'ah is re related to specific issues of ibadah, not things which the sharia is silent on. But this is the khariji mentality that came into the ummah. The khawarij and neo khawarij. But when Sayyidina Umar made hijra, radiallahu anhu, did he not go about by himself? Did he not announce his hijra in the face of the disbelievers? Is that not a form of protest? Sayyidina Suhaib al-Rumi, when he made hijra, did he not announce his hijra to everybody and gave all his wealth and went to Medina and the Prophet said to him, a good transaction. In the time of Sayyidina al-Husayn, did he not engage in protest? Sayyidina Aisha, was there not a protest? You're going to say this is bid'ah? Then you're, you're making an attack on the Sahaba, which causes us to wonder if you're actually really from Ahl Sunnah. And it continues, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, 300 of his students after his death marched against corrupted government and took a stand and were killed. So here, of course, we're talking about law-abiding demonstrations. But we have examples of this. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. The others we should donate to charities that we trust and charities that are transparent and on the ground. Whatever we have, we should support them. Number three, we should educate ourselves. We should be teaching our children the map of India, the map of Palestine, the map of parts of Africa that have been transformed so we will never forget where the Muslims were and where the Muslims are. And what history lies in those sands that belongs not just to us, but to all the communities who lived there before they were colonized. And finally, because of time, we'll address this tonight. How do we overcome the guilt? Many people say they feel guilty. They feel a sense of anguish. We'll talk about that tonight. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. As for taking and using asbab, we have so many hadith. For example, the most glaring the authentic hadith, when Sayyidina Isa will return to the earth, there are more than 70 hadith that are authentic, mutawatir, about the return of Sayyidina Isa. Don't listen to those people that say he's not coming back. 70 hadith. One of them says that when he arrives to the area of Sham, he will walk down the stairs. He will not descend to the earth because once you get in the area where physical laws apply, you have to take asbab. Now you have to walk down the minaret. So whatever means we can use to help people that is legal and will bring benefit, we should invest in them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by all of his names and attributes to help us see through this moment and be on basira and to fall in line with what the sharia teaches us about preservation of life and honor and family. These are from the maqasid of our deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring unity to the Muslims. That was going to be something else I talked about. We don't need to divide and fight now. We need to work together to help one another and coalition build with other people as we're seeing now young people doing across the country. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bi kulliha wa sifati la'ula to protect those children in Gaza and in the West Bank and in Palestine. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and protect the mothers 
and the, the people that are not talked about, the elderly. We ask Allah to protect all of the people there. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to strategically scale our power as a community so we can have an impact on the world around us and specifically what's happening in this country and the attitude of power towards those who are unjustly being oppressed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ask Allah to enter us into paradise without any reckon. We pray for Palestinians in this country. We love you. We support you. We're here for you. And we ask Allah to put us in a place to strengthen and support you and be there for you. I received a phone call yesterday from a friend who told me that his aunt called him, somehow got in touch with him from Palestine and said, we have no food. Khalas, nothing. Another friend, he called me. His uncle lost 67 family members in two days. So we want to remind our brothers and sisters from Palestine and to Ma'ala Ra'usina. And we are with you, and we will use our power and our platform to make sure people hear the truth of what's going on. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaneen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.